Is that really in the Bible? You live in a world where everyone has an opinion about the Bible. Of what values are your beliefs if they are not clearly found in the pages of your Bible? The question we must ask is, are your opinions and beliefs really found in the Bible? Well, hello, I'm David Freeman with Is That Really in the Bible? I want to begin with a troubling statement in the Bible. In fact, <clears throat> there are many troubling things that the Bible says, and especially when it comes to the words of Jesus. Jesus said, quoted many troubling statements that are, are not easy to understand. It's so troubling that it makes you wonder what God is up to. And it almost contradicts the world's view of the gospel. You know, and the world's view of the gospel is that salvation is the easiest thing in the world you'd ever seek to do or want to do. It's just raise your hand, invite Jesus into your heart, believe upon the Lord and you shall be saved. You know, it, it's presented as the easiest thing, eternal life, salvation, the easiest thing in the world you will ever do. Yet, the statement that is so troubling comes from the mouth of Jesus Christ. And here it is, Matthew 22 and verse 14. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now, that first part is encouraging. As I look at the world of churchianity, as I look at the world of Christianity, as I look at the world of 450,000 churches in America, 650,000 preachers in America, as I look at all those churches, regardless of their denomination or what they are, I do believe that many are called. Now, called means invitation. I got my invitation to the party. I just received it today in the mail. And like most people, or at least like me, you know, you get invitations and you get this free steak dinner if you will listen to the seminar about home security or invitation to a party, I hate parties, uh, invitation to this, invitation to that, and like most people, you just toss that invitation into the trash can. Okay, many are called, many get an invitation, but few are chosen. Now, what does that mean? It means few are picked out, chosen by God, to obtain salvation through Christ. Let me repeat, let those words sink deep into your ears. Few are chosen, picked out, chosen by God to obtain salva salvation through Christ. Then on top, if that weren't bad enough, then on top of that, you add this scripture, and it was a question that one of the disciples asked Jesus. And you got to ask the question, why did Christ ask the question? Excuse me, why did this disciple ask the question? What motivated this disciple to ask this question? Then said, this is Luke 13 and verse 23, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Think about that. I mean, here are the disciples walking, working with Christ, evangelizing, noticing the response, notice, noticing the lack of response. And what motivated this disciple to ask the question is, you know, he just looks around at the results and says, are there few that be saved? Luke 13, verse 24, the answer Jesus said unto them, strive to enter in the straight gate, for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Now, the word straight does not mean easy. It means narrow. It means rough. It means rocky. It means difficult way. So don't think that verse straight, you got to look up the word, the definition of the word in a strong concordance to know what the meaning of the word actually is. Okay, it does not mean easy. It means it's a difficult, rough, rocky road. And, and, and many, you know, many try it out. You know, they will strive to enter in at this rough, rocky road. They will seek to enter and shall not be able to do so. So, again, that contradicts the world's view of the gospel, of Christianity, that, that you know, that 
that God is, that salvation is the easiest thing that you will ever do. I mean, it's easier than sliding down a, a fireman's pole with WD-40 on it or grease, you know, either zoop. How easy to go from the top to the bottom, you know. Uh, just raise your hand, invite Jesus, just accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And that's it. Just, just, just say, I believe in Jesus, okay? Sort of contradicts the world's view of Christianity, you know. Now, I do believe, and don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not standing out here saying, well, I don't think anybody's going to be saved. No, that's not what I believe. I believe God has a plan to save the majority of mankind, but it involves two resurrections. And that's another story for another time. Don't have time to explain that one. Okay, but I believe ultimately the majority of mankind will be saved through a plan that God has. And chances are you've never heard that plan because you don't keep the holy days of God. If you were keeping the holy days of God, if you were being taught about the holy days of God at your church, you would understand the plan of God of salvation. That it is a plan that involves more than one, just one resurrection. Okay, but you don't understand that. Okay, but for now, many are called, but few are chosen. Why is that true? God is calling a lot of people. They just may be in the wrong church. Now, how do you know? Here's the million dollar question. How do you know that you are in the right church? Now, believe me, it's not because you like to go to church. That's not the right answer. How do you know that you are in the right church? Most people that go to church have never been exposed to the audience of God's truth. And because of that, the election, the being chosen by God to obtain salvation through Christ cannot take place. Why? Because they've never been exposed to the audience of God's truth. So my job as a minister is to expose you to the audience of God's truth. Lest, people, lest you spend the rest of your life playing church going through the motion, singing in the choir, uh, this obligation, that ob uh, leading a, ch a children's class, of uh, just working your, like, like two jobs, like having two different, two jobs, you know, uh, lest you spend your life on the merry-go-round of churchianity. So let's start with the exposure. Truth bomb number one. Just because you like to go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Did you know that? Has anybody told you that? Now you've got an illusion that you're already connected. You're already going to heaven. You're already right with God because you like to go to church. Maybe you like dressing up. Maybe you like the message. Nothing wrong with that. You know, maybe you like the people. Nothing wrong with that. But the illusion is I like to go to church. Therefore, I am right with God. I am a Christian. Just because you like to go to church does not make you a Christian. Just because you like to go to NASCAR and watch it doesn't make you a NASCAR driver. You know, you're not one of the ones out there, you know, driving the car just because you like to go to the race or whatever. Okay. All right, now, Jesus talked about people that love to go to church. Let's take a look at what he said. Matthew 7 and verse 22. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? That means inspired preaching. And in your name cast out devils. That's mighty works right there. And in your name done many wonderful works. Soup kitchen for the poor. You know, feeding the homeless, taking care of the homeless. Many wonderful works. Then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Another translation will say, then I will say unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, those workers working lawlessness. Now, I talked about you may be in the wrong church. How can you be in a church, call yourself a Christian, and at the same time be a worker of lawlessness? For example, a guy told me one time, and, and I didn't ask, uh, and he knew I was a minister, but he told me about a one-night stand he had. Yeah, got hooked up with some girl or whatever. And the next day, he's in church singing about Jesus. 
Uh, how does that work? No shame, no conviction of sin, no awareness of, of right and wrong. How do you get to be like this where you're in church, but you're a worker of lawlessness? Again, and then I will say unto them, I never knew you depart from me those working lawlessness. How do we get like this? How can a church be filled with people like this where they lack any type of real conviction of sin? Now, what I found out is that people can have remorse for sin, but remorse is only temporary. Remorse is not real repentance. Remorse is, you know, yeah, I sort of feel bad about that. I shouldn't have done that. Next week, you're doing it again, okay? Or, you know, but in other words, remorse does not lead to victory over sin. It's just remorse, you know, and it's, it's fleeting. It's temporary. It, it, it's not real Real repentance, okay? So churches are full of people who lack conviction of sin. If you held a gun to their head and said, tell me the definition of sin, they couldn't do it. What is the definition of sin? It's 1 John 3, 4. Sin is the breaking of God's law, the Ten Commandments. And so, so if you don't know the conviction of sin, if you don't know what sin is, then you don't know, okay, what it was. Okay, what am I doing that sent my Savior to die for me? to die for my sins, when you don't know what sin is, okay? Sin is the breaking of God's law. The, the Ten Commandments is God's standard of morality, how you should live your life. And it's up to you to either obey it or disobey it, okay? Now, it's not all the church's fault. I used to blame the church a lot, but in Proverbs 22 and verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he shall not depart from it. Now, that sounds okay, you know, but, but we are told to train up a child in the way he should go. Now, that begins the moment the child comes out of the womb, by the way. You start teaching the child the law of God, the way that he should walk. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6, And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently unto your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. Now, let me ask you a question, a little test here. Mothers, what did you teach your daughters about sex? Saving sex for marriage. How to identify and find the right man. How to make a man respect you. Uh, and what is respect? How do you know when a man is respecting you? Uh, how do you know when a man is respecting you? And what did, 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 did you teach your daughters about lust, the difference, the difference between lust and love? Now, if the answer is, well, I, I didn't teach anything, well, where were you as a mother? What were you doing as a mother? What, why did you exist as a mother if you weren't ta teaching your daughters these things? Okay. What good did your church do in helping you teach? your daughters these things. Now, Father, what did you teach your sons about sex? How to respect a woman, how to identify a loose woman. How do you identify a loose woman? A loose woman can't say no. Okay, that's how you identify a loose woman. She can't say no. Okay. What did you teach your sons about saving sex for marriage? What did you teach your sons about lust, the difference between lust and love? The evils of pornography. What did you? T what have you taught your son? What is the chance that your son in today's society will not come across pornography? Zero. Okay. Inter you know, phone, tablets, whatever. Zero. So what are you going to do about it? Now, what did you teach your sons about not taking advantage of women? Now, if the answer, oh, I didn't teach you. I just. Figured they'd learn it on their own. Yeah, they, they will learn on their own, I guarantee you. And you will be judged for not teaching them, your children. Probably harshly by God, I mean, for not just teaching. Now, I, did, I just touched on one area, sexuality. There's other, nine other commandments we could go through. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 6, And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. As a parent, here's the problem. As, the, as a parent, you can't give away what you don't have. What you don't know, you don't know that you don't know it. Okay? You can't teach your children what you don't know yourself. And that's the problem, you see. This is why the church, in most cases, is no different than people in the world. 
It, it, this is why you have worldly churches. They're no different. Churches are full of people who lack any conviction whatsoever of sin. They don't even know what it is. And it's not necessarily the church's fault. Yes, there is a teaching out there that makes the law of God, which defines what is sin, unimportant. And that does come from church. And if you've been in church for five hours, you've probably heard this. It goes like this. The law's been abolished. The law's been nailed to the cross. Faith plus nothing. And, you know, if you try to keep the law, that would be works. It's, you know, and so you're left with the illusion. Our children were, are left with the illusion, well, that's a, if I try to, keep, try to keep the law, that's works. And then works is wrong. And I just, I, I, I'm free to do whatever I want to do. Okay. These people, these preachers don't understand the role of the law. The role of the law was not given to save you. It was given as God's standard of morality to define what is sin, what's right and what's wrong. It's your choice whether you keep it or not. If you don't keep the law, don't call yourself a Christian. Now, I'm not saying we're perfect at it. I'm not saying that. But the willingness to do it. The submission to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Okay which involves obedience, by the way. I know people hate to hear that word in church, obedience. It's like a bad word. The O word. Don't say that word in church. Obedience. Oh, we're talking about works. Works is a sin. Yeah. I'll tell you, churches have been brainwashed, and they have brainwashed you, the listener, okay? Now, many ministers are dealing with the cold, hard reality that their congregation is no different than the world. They're more worldly than they are godly. Yes, that's what preachers are up against today. Because the congregation you're talking to, their parents did not teach them the law of God. They failed to train up a child in the way he should go. You see, the responsibility to teach our children God's law was never given to the church. It was never given. It was given to the parents to teach their children. And it takes top priority over any type of public education, schooling, whatever you want to talk, college degree. No, the responsibility is given to teach God's law is given to you, the parents. And, and most of us have failed miserably in this area. Okay. All right, truth bomb number two, why you may be in the wrong church. God's not real, and there's no fear of God in your church. Yeah, yeah. Why, why is God not real? You ever ask that question? Why is God not real to me? Because when we read scriptures in the Bible, I'll go through three here. Proverbs 5 and verse 21. For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his going. So, okay, God knows the ways of man. It's right in front of God's eyes. Proverbs 15 and verse 3. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So it's not like we're hiding anything from God. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every man may receive the things done in his body according to that he has done whether it be good or bad. Now, <clears throat> we know God sees all and, and that you can't hide from God and there's nothing that can be hidden from our, from our God. Our actions, our decisions, our bad decisions, they're not hid from God. God sees them and not only that, we're going to give an account to God for our bad actions and the things that we do. Now, if you look at some of the statistics out there, of people, you know, I say there's no real fear of God in church, you know, looking at pornography. There was a statistic that men in, in church, over 50% of men in church admit to looking at pornography, you know, and it's just committing adultery. Adultery is the hallmark sin of our nation. It's, it's like that's what you're expected to do. If you watch TV, I was at a restaurant eating eating and and they had the tv on and i hate tv they had a i think soap opera on and here was this poor woman she couldn't decide what man she wanted to go bed to bed with 
You know, was it this man? Was it that man? Or was it this man? Three of them, you know. Could, could, poor dear couldn't figure it out which one she wanted to go to bed with, you know. And that's our society. Like I said, it's the hallmark sin of our na uh, nation, adultery. It's looked at as common. It's looked at as that's what you're supposed to do, you know. Well, it's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to get a life and fear God is what we're supposed to do. But you have all kinds of things that people do and still call themselves a Christian. Stealing from the office. Well, it's no big deal if I steal from the office, if I take the paper clips, if I take the paper home or whatever. You know, people that blurt out the name of GD, you know, uh, God's name. You know, I've always wondered, why doesn't God, why doesn't a bolt of lightning come down from heaven and just zap them? I mean, that's what I would do if I were God. I'd just people that curse God's name in vain, just zap them. Just you know, just nothing but a piece, a blob left on the ground. You know, that's what I would do. But, you know, people do this and they call them, they go to church, they call themselves a Christian for pity's sake. You're in the wrong church when God is not real to you. Now, a lot of people base too much on their emotions. Well, I just feel the presence of God. I just, the music makes me feel so close to, the entertainment makes me feel so close to God. And look, there's a lot of churches that you can go to where all they have is music and entertainment and the message may be 15 minutes long. And it will be a bunch of pablum at that, a bunch of baby food, you know. Now, the, the real fear of God, you know, it, it, and when God is not real, the real fear of God is, is it's about how you live your life. It's about how you choose to live your life daily. How will I live my life today? You wake up and you ask that question. How will I, how will I, what will I do if I'm tempted? Okay. What will I do? You know what your weakness is. And so does Satan the devil, by the way. But uh, which, which makes things a little tricky. But you know what your temptation is. And if you know it, how do you prepare for it in the morning? How do you prepare for it in the day? What's your plan of action to get out from under it? Okay. Are you a person of honor? A person of honor who is one who accepts full responsibility for his or her actions. You know, there's been stories of soldiers that have dove on live hand grenades uh, just to save others. You know, I mean, sacrifice themselves. Okay? So I want to tell you a little story here, a little analogy to help you understand. Now, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Because the reason I'm telling you this is because we don't focus on this side of the issue. All we ever focus on is grace, grace, and I'm forgiven, and grace, and more grace, and, and I'm forgiven. Okay, but we don't focus on the other side that the Bible says what you earn for sinning is death. And I want you to imagine, okay, you're about to commit a sin, or you have committed a sin, and you give God the destroying weapon. Now, this is something you do in your mind's eye, you know, hopefully before you fall into sin. And you say, God, if I commit this sin that I am contemplating, I will honor you. I will be, I will accept full responsibility for my sin, which is death. And in your mind's eye, you hand God the destroying weapon and say, take my life. I deserve to die. Yeah, one sin, whatever it matters. It can be a big one, it can be a little one. Okay, but you hand God the destroying weapon in your mind's eye. Again, this is something you do in your mind's eyes because we know that the grace of God covers our sin. I'm just saying that's all we ever focus on, that the grace of God covers my sin. I'm not saying that's bad, but I'm saying we need to consider both sides of the issue, that the wages of sin is death in God's eyes. And being a man of honor, being a man of respect, being a man who says, I'll take full responsibility for what I'm about to do if I do it. Okay? This is, how you can this is how God can become real in your life. This is how you can have the fear of God in your life. By understanding every time we, we sin, we crucify Jesus af afresh. We nail him to the cross again when we sin. Now, truth bomb number three is why you may be in the wrong church. 
if you don't understand what God expects from you, and the, way, the only way to understand what God expects from you is to have the Holy Spirit of God, to receive the, way, the Spirit of God, and there's a way to receive the Spirit of God. Romans 8 and verse 13, For if we live after the flesh, you shall die. Notice that. You live after the flesh, what comes natural, feels good, do it, you're going to die. But if you through the Spirit, you got to have the Spirit to do this, do mortify, and that means put to death, the deeds of the body you shall live. Like I said, you know, mortify, put to death the deeds of the body. Every time we sin, we crucify Jesus afresh. Imagine, now let's get positive here. Imagine Christ Jesus saying to you, you are not the same man or woman you used to be. You are not the sinner you used to be. Because this is the ultimate goal, by the way, of real conversion. You know, and, and Christ would say, you're not the person you used to be. No, that man is dead, for you have killed him. You have mortified the deeds of the flesh. Through the power of my grace and spirit, you have killed him, the old man. You have put to death the deeds of the body. Of course, the problem is we're not often satisfied with the progress that we're making, but imagine God saying that to you. You're not the man you used to be, for you have killed him. So maybe you're in the right church. If you realize there's more to being a Christian than just going to church, you must have a conviction of sin. And much of that lack of conviction is because of the failure to be trained up by our parents in the way we should go. It's not to blame your parents, it's just you can't, you gotta realize your parents couldn't give you what they didn't have, you know, what they didn't have. Okay, you just gotta understand that. And you may be in the right church if, if God is real and you truly fear God. If you understand what God expects from you, and that is only possible by the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to give you the biblical definition of a real church. Here it is, Hebrews 12 and verse 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven. We're not talking about just the call. We're talking about the chosen who have been chosen to receive salvation. And to God, the judge of all, and to the just and to the spirits of just men made perfect. Yeah, there is your real church. And again, I want to leave you with God saying to you, hey, you're not the old person you used to be. For you have killed him. You're not the sinner you used to be. You have put that old man to death. I'm David Freeman, and that's what's really in your Bible. Many people spend their whole life repeating the same old mistakes. What does it take to have good discernment and good judgment? It takes having the Spirit of God. But what many people overlook is, the Spirit of God is not something that you are born with. Man was created incomplete, missing that spiritual element that would make him complete. The Bible clearly lays out the way to receive the Spirit of God. Learn the step-by-step -step process for receiving the Spirit of God. Order your free copy of Why You Need the Holy Spirit. Order by writing to Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. That's Church of God Rocky Mount, 27 Brookledge Lane, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. Also, visit us on the web at isthatreallyinthebible.org.